Happy New Year. Uh, we're a week into the new year. Uh, done. Finished already. Uh, we like to get self-reflective around New Year's time. Or as I've discovered uh, in the last week or two, there's two types of people. Uh, let's see which one you are. Uh, there's one person who likes to get very self-reflective, uh, set New Year's goals, resolutions, all that sort of thing. Uh, and there's another sort of person uh, who doesn't need the New Year, an arbitrary date, uh, to force them to make changes in their life that they could make at any other time of the year. Okay. And in my case, those two people live together. <coughs> Love you, Shannon. Um, if you are like me, and you like setting New Year's resolutions that you're inevitably not going to keep. Okay. Um, you like to be self-reflective. You like to have a think about uh, how you could improve, uh, say, in a year's time. Uh, there was a time in history when the disciples, if you like, they got a bit self-reflective. Um, they had a desire to improve, and it's documented for us. Um, how that happened for them was that they watched the life of Jesus um, watched his life, saw what he was doing. Uh, they had a quick look back at their own life and then they went to Jesus uh, in person and asked him to teach them something. Okay, They said, Lord, teach us to... What do you think they asked for before I tell you? Okay, Some of you already know. Well done. Extra points. Uh, for those of you who don't know or didn't hear what they just said... Um, like they asked, Lord, teach us to. Now consider these 12 people, very ordinary people, um, just followers of Jesus. And when we say that, uh, not following Twitter, Instagram, all that sort of stuff, like they really saw everything he did. Um, they saw his healings. They saw him heal people who had never seen before, uh, heal people who had never walked before, uh, heal people who were demon-possessed. They saw Jesus heal people who were dead with a word. I mean, these guys were in a boat, uh, which Jesus got into, they saw him get into off of the water. And on a, at a different time, maybe it was the same boat, um, they saw Jesus get up and speak to the winds and the waves. It said he rebuked them, almost like he told the wind and the waves off. Naughty waves, uh, go to bed, stop it. And, and it stopped. And the disciples, I reckon they were probably a little bit scared at that point. Um, they would have asked themselves, like, who is this person that's in this boat with us? They saw all of this firsthand and they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Of all the things they could have asked, they asked for help on how to pray. That wouldn't have been my first guess, besides knowing it already, what they asked for. I would have asked for a lot of other things, maybe not prayer. So the question I have is why? Why did they ask this of Jesus? I think it's because they saw how often Jesus relied on prayer and they saw the results of his life, amazing results of his life, and they said, there's something in that. There's something in the fact that he prays so often that we want as well. We want a bit of that. Uh, you know, the Gospels are not exhaustive. Uh, when I say the Gospels, I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the accounts of the life of Jesus. They don't cover absolutely everything that happened in the life of Jesus. They're condensed. It's the main events, right? And Jesus is found praying in them all the time. In preparing this message, I, I put together with a thanks, with help from Google, um, a bit of a list of all the times Jesus is found praying. And I intentionally didn't add it to my notes because we just don't have time to go over all of those instances. I thought about during the week, um, if a condensed account of my life was put together, uh, first of all, boring, I wouldn't bother reading it. Uh, it wouldn't be the world's bestseller year on year on year like the Bible is. Uh, but secondly, I asked myself, um, how often would prayer come up as something that I lean on and rely on in, in a condensed account of my life? I thought to myself, I don't think it would come up that often. And yet, in the story of Jesus, it comes up all the time. The beautiful thing is Jesus is a teacher. Um, he, he didn't rebuke the disciples for asking and saying, well, that's a silly question. Uh, he taught them 
and he teaches us. And it's known as the Lord's Prayer. And whatever your background is, whether it is in, in church and Christianity or you come here this morning quite uh, fresh to Christianity, uh, you'll probably hear the Lord's Prayer and go, man, I've heard this before. Uh, this is quite a familiar sounding thing to me. And I just want you to know that I've prayed uh, for all of you, uh, for all of us, um, that you would see it with fresh eyes. Um, I'm quite excited to share this with you because I have seen it with fresh eyes um, that I haven't seen it with before. And, and yeah, really quite excited to share that with you uh, this morning. So I hope you brought your Bibles uh, with you. You know, as Christians, we believe God came to us as a person. Uh, sometimes that just rolls off the tongue. As Christians, we believe God came to us as a person. I can't improve on the teaching of Jesus. Uh, so I won't even try. Uh, this morning, my job is simply to explain what he's already said thousands of years ago and how it's still just as applicable today as it was back then. Okay, so if you want to get your Bibles ready, it is in Matthew chapter 6 we're going to be reading. Before we do that, I need help, you need help. Uh, let me just pray. Oh, Father, I just thank you that you know uh, every single person in this room. Uh, you know the year they've had. You know the week they've had. Um, you know their needs. And Father, I don't know everyone in this room. Um, I don't know their weeks, their years, or their needs. So Father, I just pray as, as we declare what you've already said, um, that you would just speak to every one of us and meet the needs of, uh, the varied needs of everyone in this room. Just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to read through Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to 13. This is um, like one of the most comprehensive corners of the Bible, teaching on prayer. Okay. Um, we're going to read it in full to begin with and then take it bit by bit and just chew on it. Okay. Uh, so starting in verse 5, it says this, Jesus says this, And when you pray, uh, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, uh, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, uh, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from evil. That's going to be our focus for this morning, those verses that we just read we're going to start from verse 5. Jesus starts off by telling us how not to pray, what not to do. Okay? He says this in verse 5. He calls out a type of prayer, not a type of prayer, a type of prayer, person who prays. He says, and when you pray, uh, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. See, Jesus here calls a certain type of people a hypocrites. Jesus wasn't afraid to label when he thought it was uh, necessary. Who are hypocrites? Uh, well, it's the sort of people, Jesus says, who pray to God uh, for the purpose of others seeing them pray. I mean, that is why they're praying. And Jesus, in the strongest terms possible here, says you must not pray like that. Pray like the hypocrites, he calls them. Um, he goes on to say, Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. What is their reward? You might ask yourself. Well, it's kind of implicit in the text in that they're praying so that others can see them. They got it. They got what they went to prayer for. The eyeballs of other people watching them pray. They got it. Now, before we shrug this off and say, well, I don't pray like that. That's good uh, if you don't. Uh, but we need to acknowledge in each and every one of us, um, there's an impulse um, to seek our validation from other people, um, to look good, 
to look spiritual, um, to look put together. And it can corrupt even the best of things, uh, even the most wonderful of things like prayer. What's the solution? Jesus gives it to us in verse 6. He says, but when you pray, uh, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Is Jesus forbidding public prayer here? Our answer is no. Otherwise, he'd be preaching against himself. Uh, Jesus prayed in public a lot. Okay, he's not forbidding public prayer. Instead, he's making a point. And the point Jesus is making is our motivation to pray should be simply to be seen by God. Such that if you're in your room and the door was closed, no one was there, you would have lost zero motivation to pray. Because you're praying to be seen by God and not by other people. Okay? So we need to heed the first warning. Uh, what is your motivation to pray? Okay, that's what Jesus starts with. Uh, he goes on, he calls out a second type. This time he calls out a prayer. Not a type of prayer, but a, a type of prayer. Uh, it's in verse 7. He says, And when you pray, uh, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard uh, for their many words. Okay. Uh, when I think of heap up empty phrases, uh, I think of first thought that comes to mind is when you turn on the news and you're watching a politician um, explain or give an answer to a question, they can talk for minutes in English. And at the end of it, you ask yourself, I have no idea what they said. Talk about heaping up empty phrases. Okay, that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Jesus here says, don't do that in prayer. Don't heap up empty phrases. Uh, or as Kevin from The Office would say, uh, why waste time lot word when few word do trick? I bet you never thought you'd see the day. Kevin from The Office does a commentary on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, there we go. Uh, question is, why shouldn't we use our words too much? Why shouldn't, what's Jesus' problem with heaping up empty phrases? Uh, it's not because it's weird uh, or pretentious, as we Australians like to sometimes think of our politicians. That's not why we shouldn't. The reason is in verse 8, Jesus says, For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. How many times do you find yourself in prayer praying for someone and you find yourself uh, giving their background to God, telling him what life they've had or suggesting what you think their needs are to God as if he doesn't know their background and as if he doesn't know what their needs are? You know, what's wonderful about this part of Scripture is Jesus is inviting us to a relational approach to prayer, not an intellectual exercise where we need to get everything right and tell him and summarise the situation really well. Uh, but we need to just rely on a God who knows, who knows. Maybe you've been in prayer meetings and things before and you've felt a bit self-conscious about the fact that you can't string together a lot of uh, great words. Jesus says that's quite okay. And we need to uh, take that on board and that is awesome and good news when we come to prayer. Um, verse 9, Jesus begins to tell us how to pray. Now that we know how not to pray, uh, how to pray. He says, pray then like this. Here we go, Lord's Prayer. Uh, we're going to read the first half. He says, Our Father in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason I want to stop there is it kind of is bookended by two mentions of heaven. It's worth just stopping to note uh, that the Bible teaches there is a present reality of a place called heaven, as it is in heaven. Uh, and Jesus says not only that, but it should be the foundation for our prayer life or the springboard for which all of our requests come from. Our first priority in prayer is getting our minds in heaven. I could ask you, how often do you think about heaven? How often do you think about heaven? Because that should give an indication of how often, how deep your prayer life is. When I was a kid, I used to try and um, get my head around eternity and, and the thought of heaven genuinely made me want to throw up. 
um, the thought that it never ends. It goes on forever. Uh, I couldn't get my head around it. And it genuinely made me feel a bit sick. Um, so question, how should we think about heaven? Heaps of questions. Heaps we could unpack here that I'd love to unpack and talk about. Um, but I think what Jesus wants us to know, first and foremost, is it's less about a place, heaven, and more about a person. Our first priority is getting our heads around heaven, but a father in heaven. You know, the nine verses we read at the start, um, and we're going through now, um, mentions father six times in my translation. Father, 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 father. Six times. Jesus is trying to tell us something by this. You know, the Jews at the time, uh, many of them, and, and still there would be many today, um, thought the name of God was too sacred to be even uttered, said out loud, uh, just in case his name could be caused offence by what, what they said. And part of that is absolutely right. It says in this prayer, hallowed be your name. And he kind of respected, revered, holy. No one's like God. That is right. But at the same time, Jesus says, call him dad. You know, I have the best parents in the world. Um, so that's immediately good news to me, that God is my dad. Um, to some of you, that's not immediately good news. And I just want you to know that I've prayed for you, uh, that your experience of a father or what you understand fatherhood to be um, could be changed, could be shaped by seeing who God our Father is. That's going to be a real focus of our time, uh, the rest of our time this morning. I want you to know that you're probably not alone, um, sadly, in that. I think there's a lot of confusion in culture about what a father's role actually is. Uh, you can disagree with me on this, but I feel like, whether intentionally or not, uh, our culture is dumbing down dads. Uh, dumbing down a dad's role. As one Reddit thread states pretty bluntly, uh, name me one cartoon dad who is not a bumbling idiot. Um, in the West, I think we're more confused than ever, particularly if you're in a, a non-Christian kind of circle or background. What is a dad supposed to do and be? Um, I realised as I studied this in the last few weeks that Jesus is actually telling us what sort of father our God is. He's telling us what sort of father our God is. And I think at the same time, um, Jesus is speaking into every culture on planet Earth, speaking to every dad that's ever existed about how they are supposed to be a dad. Uh, every earthly father is meant to point to a heavenly father. How are they supposed to do that? I think the Lord's Prayer actually speaks into that. So we're going to be doing two things, looking at how God is our father, and also how that's supposed to be modelled by a father, particularly in relation to the family and the children. Okay? Uh, and we hear it in the request of this prayer. We hear it in the request of this prayer in verses 11, 12 and 13. I want to give you an example just to kind of get your heads around this. Now, please stick with me on this. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, it requires a bit of thought. Okay? Uh, so, for example, if I asked my dad uh, for a mansion, okay? only a few people in this room know my dad, Assuming I was absolutely serious and I wasn't joking and I told you that I asked my dad for a mansion for Christmas, okay, what would you conclude about my dad? He's rich. That's exactly the answer I was expecting you to say. Okay. He's rich. You don't know my dad, but you know through my request what my dad is like. Okay. Jesus, in verses 11, 12 and 13 in this prayer, is inviting us to ask things of our Father. Okay. And whether you know this Father or not, we find out things about our Father through the requests that we're able to ask. Jesus is giving us a model of prayer. He says, you can ask this. Okay. We're finding out about who he is as a Father. So as I like to do when I, I, I do give a sermon, I like to give my answer kind of at the start and then show you how I got to it. Okay. So big question that we're going to ask a few times is, what kind of Father is our God? Again, to some of us, that's immediately good news that he's a father. Some of us, it's not. What kind of father is he? My answer is, and if you're a note taker, this would be a good one. 
Um, what kind of father is our God? Our Father in heaven uh, is all satisfying, saving, and sovereign. That our Father in heaven is all satisfying, saving, and sovereign. I'm going to take them one by one. Uh, first of all, in verse 11, Jesus says, uh, Give us this day our daily bread. So we ought to ask ourselves when we hear that, uh, what does this request reveal about our Father? What does this request reveal? First of all, it reveals that he's a satisfying Father. And let me show you why. Okay. Uh, first of all, when I read this, it's a bit of a letdown. Uh, we've established that God is the God of all heaven and all earth. And, and not only that, hallowed be his name, he's holy. Um, he's your Father. You can ask things of him. Think of the possibilities of what we can ask for. And Jesus says, yeah, uh, ask him for bread. Not even a burger. Ask him for bread. What, what, what is this request all about? What, what is Jesus trying to communicate to us? Uh, I think we're given a strong hint in that Jesus seems to be at pains to tell us it's daily bread. In my translation, it says, give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't just say give us bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And I think this, I believe this is a strong connection back to Israelite, Israel uh, in the desert. We need to go back there just for, just for a moment. Okay, get our heads in that story. Um, God's just done all these amazing miracles in Egypt. Um, brought all of the people of Israel uh, out from slavery. Uh, brought all the plagues on the Egyptians and spared the Israelites. All culminated in the Red Sea crossing uh, where they crossed on dry land. The Egyptians... Uh, were, were struck down, those who were chasing them. Um, when I was in Sunday school, that was the best story, by the way. I, I love that one. Uh, sort of thing, you'd go to the beach afterwards after that and you'd be looking for Israelites in the waves. You'd be, pick up a stick and, God, do it again, do it again. Uh, it's, it's a classic, that one. Um, but they find themselves in a desert after that scenario. And we pick up the story where they're complaining uh, because they don't have food. Now, when I was a kid... Uh, it was like a, these guys are idiots kind of moment. After all the things God's just done for them, and now they're complaining and they're angry. Uh, the reality is they are all too human uh, and they have daily needs. And one of them is food. And uh, the wonderful thing is God feeds them all without fail. Um, he provides them with manna. Just to put some numbers on it, God fed at least... 600,000 people every day for 40 years. And you thought catering for Christmas was hard. And it is. God can cater for 600,000 people every day for 40 years like that. Like that. First thing this request reveals for us is that God cares about your daily needs. He really cares about them. So the encouragement is talk to him about your daily needs and trust him with them. Trust him that he will provide with them. What it tells us about culture, I believe, is that the responsibility to provide for the children falls on uh, the father. Uh, with our heavenly father, he wants us to trust him with uh, more, surpassing trust than just our food. Um, there was a situation at the start of Jesus' ministry uh, where he uh, went into the desert and fasted for 40 days, uh, right at the start of his ministry. And first of all, 40 days. If we're going back 40 days from today, uh, we're going back, we're dipping into November of 2023. Jesus was hungry, uh, physically hungry. And Satan comes to him in this kind of amazing uh, event and, and tempts him and, and points at a stone on the ground or somewhere and says, turn that into bread. There we go, bread. And Jesus responds, his response is fascinating. Uh, he says this, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now what does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? What he means is, I don't live for a satisfied stomach. Man does not live by bread alone. What he means is, I live for a satisfied life. I live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you like what Jesus is saying is, I believe 
in a satisfying father. A life lived by his word is satisfying. It's surpassing. It goes beyond his need for food, even after 40 days of not eating food. Question for you is, do you believe in a satisfying father? Or another question, where do you look to the world to satisfy you? Uh, Is it money? Is it status? Uh, Is it sex? Is it success? What kind of father is our God? Uh, First of all, he's satisfying. He cares about your daily needs and he satisfies beyond into eternal needs. Verse 12, we get our second request, our second big ask. It says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We can ask that of God. Jesus invites that of us. We can ask that of our Father. What does this request reveal? It reveals that we have a saving Father, a Father who saves. I also think it speaks into culture in telling us that a good Father forgives his children. What does that look like? Every culture would do that differently. Uh, I thought, with my words, I'll just paint two pictures of you, for you, uh, of like a father who does forgiveness uh, bad, not well. Uh, One is a demanding father. Uh, One is a dismissive father. Demanding father. If you had a demanding father, he would have made you pay for your mistakes. Um, He held held you to account. You made mistakes. Uh, And you needed to be held to account. And that was, in one sense, good. Um, But you were never extended any grace uh, for the mistakes that you made to deal with the shame of the past, of of the decisions that you've made. And the effect is, if you are constantly held to account and never extended grace, uh, that you can never live down your past. I kind of think of it as you're in a prison of your past self that you can't break out of in relation to a demanding father. You're stuck. Demanding father, or you had a dismissive father, maybe. Um, Two different pictures. Um, Who extends grace to you when you make a mistake, um, but there's no cost involved. There's no boundaries set up. There's no accountability on offer there. And the effect of that uh, is if you're constantly forgiven without a cost being paid, without there being any, being called to account, Uh, you can never move purposely forward into the future. To put it bluntly, people that have a father who's extremely dismissive or absent um, sometimes end up in prison in the future um, because the accountability they didn't get growing up uh, catches up with them in the legal and the justice systems. What forgiveness requires, and what we learn from those two scenarios, is it requires a cost to be paid, requires there be some form of accountability but also that grace be extended to cover the shame of what you've done in the past. So our question, what kind of father is our God? Uh, Colossians 2, 13 to 14 answers it perfectly. It says, God, having forgiven us all our trespasses uh, by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's good news. To quote uh, William Wallace, not in his accent, not at the same volume, uh, freedom, freedom. In Jesus, the cost has been so totally absorbed, so totally absorbed, our sins have been held to account that he can extend grace, grace to you and I. That is such good news. And here's the test, that you know that you believe that you experienced a saving father. Verse 12 says, you forgive others when they wrong you. You wear costs. You might ask, where do I find the resources for that? You believe you have a saving father who wore your costs. Believe you have a saving father who has worn all of your costs. I heard a quote many years ago that's really stuck with me ever since. You've probably heard it before. Um, It's that the world doesn't read the Bible. The world will read Christians. The non-Christian people in your life, the people who don't believe in the Father that we're talking about today, when they wrong you, make a mistake by you, 
What are they going to feel? What are they going to see? Hopefully, I pray that what they'll see is good works that give glory to our Father who is in heaven. That they'll feel the forgiveness that we feel from Jesus. And we know from Jesus. We get to our last ask. First of all, we've got that he's satisfying and saving. Verse 13 says, We can ask of God that he lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from evil. So what does this request reveal about our Father? And lastly, this is that he is a sovereign uh, Father. He is sovereign. Sovereign, kind of a weird word. Uh, it's, it's just a way of saying God rules. It's this idea of being above, of being over. Uh, we used to we talk about the king in England as being like a sovereign in terms of being above, over. Uh, God is sovereign. Where do I get that? Uh, in verse 13, lead us not into temptation. Uh, if you're crying out for leadership, what are you asking? Uh, you're asking, you're saying, God, you're smarter than I am. I need to be led. I'm not smart enough to lead my own life. God, lead me. If you're asking for deliverance, what are you actually asking? You're saying, God, you're stronger than I am. I can't deliver myself from evil. You can. To be able to pray this, verse 13, it comes with the open admission that we are weak. We're not smart. And we're not strong even to lead our own lives. But we know who is. We know who is. Uh, I think this speaks into culture in that a, a good earthly father uses his aboveness as the head of the family um, and exercises that in one main way to lead and to protect his family. And above every dad, good or bad, is a father in heaven uh, who uses his aboveness as the head of the church in one main way in relation to us here to lead and to deliver us to protect us from evil. That is good news. That is such good news. If you let that sink into your bones, that he's a sovereign father, um, you'll become a person of rest. Not naive. Everything doesn't happen good all of a sudden. All the lights don't turn green. Uh, all sickness isn't healed. But you become a person of rest in a sovereign father who controls the universe. Sometimes the miracle we receive in prayer is loss of fretfulness as we realise, I don't run the universe. God does. Who is in control of your life? And what areas of your life are you still holding on to control over? You need to give to God our Father. Just as we kind of come to a bit of a conclusion, um, for us to lean on prayer... Jesus tells us in this prayer that we need to believe in the Father that he is presenting us. We need to believe in the Father he's presenting us in our experience in the world. The secret to life and the motivation as a Christian to live um, is in knowing and trusting a Father in heaven. A Father who's satisfying, who can meet our every need, surpassing food, uh, that he's saving, that we've got freedom in our relationship in regards to him, and that he's sovereign. He uses his aboveness to lead and protect us. Let me pray. Father, thank you that uh, you know our needs and that you present yourself to us. Thank you that I don't have to heap up lots of empty phrases uh, when I talk to you, Father, but that you just know, you know what we need. And Father, first and foremost, we need to know and see you for who you really are. Father, show us in our hearts, in our time this week in devotion, show us who you are. And let us revel in that, let us worship in that, let us love that. We pray for your Holy Spirit's help in that because we can't do that alone. We are weak and we need your help. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.